Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to be able to present uh, a paper uh, I've uh, put together uh, looking at a similar topic, which is uh, the question of how do we uh, think about uh, composite indicators of which multidimensional poverty is one, uh, and particularly this issue of robustness. And the previous uh, speaker kindly provided some of the motivation. Uh, he noted correctly that these indicators are becoming extremely popular. Uh, we all know the Human Development uh, uh, Index uh, by the UNDP. Uh, and whilst there are some noted conceptual difficulties with these indicators, one of the main critiques that comes up time and time again is that there are significant uncertainties in how they're constructed. And uh, the point made by the previous speaker is about, for example, arbitrary weights. So we use weighting, different weighting vectors and so on and so forth to create these indices. Uh, but how robust are they? Uh, do we get different results if we use a different set of weights, for example? So the fundamental question that uh, I look at in this, in this paper is really that, is that our comparisons for example, between two units, let's say two countries, or two different groups in, in the same country, uh, are, are, is a comparison robust to the specific construction choices used to develop that indicator? Or more simply, is there some choice of parameters that switches the order of two units? And my attempt, uh, or my answer is, yes, we can do that, almost certainly. And I'll explain what I mean by almost certainly. Let me just clarify that just to fix ideas. Uh, this is the human development uh, indicators for two countries, China and Botswana. Uh, and there's three dimensions. There's the uh, life expectancy, uh, there's education, and there's income. Uh, so China clearly outperforms Botswana, has got a higher value on life expectancy. But on education and income, Botswana marginally uh, outperforms China. So clearly, we can see that it, Depending on how we weight these different dimensions, we might come to a different conclusion uh, about which country has a higher level of development. That's just to give, give you an idea. But let's uh, very briefly look at some more specific definitions. What is a composite indicator? So a composite indicator in a very general form is just a mapping from a set of parameters, theta, which uh, I assume is taken from some compact space, uh, and a set of raw data. So, for example, in the HDI, the Human Development Index, it's these dimension-specific uh, values. Uh, and I assume that this mapping is, is well-behaved, uh, and then it gives us uh, just some, typically a single number. The next definition is important. Uh, it's this idea of point-wise dominance. So we can say that um, a variable y, which is our composite indicator, point-wise dominates another random variable, say yj, uh, if yi is higher or for all feasible values of theta in the parameter space. So, so that means for any choice of parameters, yi is higher or equal to uh, yj. So for any choice of parameters, that's, that's the important. So that's really the definition of robustness. So my definition of a robustness for composite indicators is that yi pointwise point dominates yj, or yj pointwise dominates yi. So in a way, it would be saying that a comparison is robust if for any choice of parameters, we come to the same conclusion, at least in terms of one is higher than the other. We can also uh, relax that slightly and get a degree of robustness, uh, which is simply the share of points in the parameter space for which yi is superior to yj. So that's, uh, the, these are just relatively simple definitions. Uh, the question is, how do we go about looking at this? So the proposal uh, here is to use stochastic search. So stochastic search is taking random draws from the parameter space and evaluating uh, the, the, uh, the composite indicator uh, for each draw. What are the advantages of this? Well, the advantages is that the establishing robustness from properties of multivariate distributions is highly problematic, particularly with nonlinear functions. 
So ideally, we would like an analytical solution to the problem. We haven't got one. And indeed, stochastic search is used extremely widely where we have these kind of unknown complex spaces. Moreover, as long as we can take an infinite number of draws, we're guaranteed to find the result. So for any, for as long as we can keep on taking a draw, we're bound to sample every point in the, in the sample space, basically. And this is what is used in a lot of stochastic optimization methods. Moreover, it also generates an estimate of the empirical outcome distribution. So we can actually undertake these pointwise dominance uh, uh, estimates or calculations. There are disadvantages, of course. The curse of dimensionality. So as we have many, many parameters that we can choose from, the volume of the search space increases geometrically. So then the question becomes, well, how do we know when we stopped? Because for any finite number of draws, there's always going to be some area of the search space, of the parameter space, that hasn't been explored. And this, is, this occurs uh, in lots of different areas. Uh, and for those of you familiar with the econometrics or cross-country growth literature, we have Salah E. Martin's two million regressions. It's a similar idea. He's exploring the parameter space, uh, in this case, of specifications. This is particularly important when we're talking about robustness, because robustness, by definition, refers to all points in the parameter space, not just a representative sample of them. So the question really is, how many draws are enough? And that's, that's one of the fundamental things that I look at here. How many draws from a stochastic distribution, well, from stochastic draws are enough. Which means really, oh, there's a strange large there, but ignore that. So which really means how much of the outcome space have I visited after n random draws? Let's say I've taken 10 random draws. Is that enough? 100 random draws, a million random draws. How much of the outcome space have I seen? Now, it turns out that we can actually estimate this. One way of thinking about it is, let's assume the search space is discrete. Could be extremely large, but there's a discrete number, uh, there's a countable number of potential outcomes. And this is really something known as the classic balls in the box problem. So let's imagine I have uh, an unknown number of boxes, let's say an unknown number of seats in the room, and I just keep throwing balls randomly, and they keep landing in a box. And this is my, these are my boxes. But it turns out that if I count how many uh, boxes I've seen after n throws, this actually will provide me the information about how much of the outcome space I've seen. The example is that if I keep throwing balls into boxes and I keep seeing all the same boxes again and again, that's in indicating to me that I've seen a lot of the potential outcomes. So it turns out that this problem has been looked at before in a very different context during the World War II to uh, crack German ciphers. And I.J. Good and Alan Turing came up with uh, uh, what they might call a naive estimator of this, which is their estimator of missing mass. And it turns out that it's simply uh, their estimate of missing mass is the number of b boxes I've just seen once, the C1, divided by the number of throws. That's all it is. We can get slightly less uh, or more conservative versions, sorry, uh, under the assumption of non-uniform distributions. So this gives us a starting point. So if this estimate of missing mass falls below some desirable threshold, let's say 5%, then this can be uh, the basis of a stopping rule. And in principle, I could then assert, well, pointwise dominance holds for at least 1 minus this uh, threshold certainty. So I'm almost certain that I've seen all the outcomes in the parameter space. Of course, you're now going to say, what about continuous outcomes? But my answer is that for all kind of empirical problems that we're looking at, for example, in multidimensional poverty, we can always undertake some form of rounding rule which is empirically v uh, valid. For example, uh, a difference between a headcount poverty measure at 50.001 and 50.0011 is, for 
in virtually all circumstances, empirically indistinguishable. So we can use those rounding rules to discretize a continuous distribution. Fine. If you don't like that, we can have another measure. So under the assumption that W, which is our mapping function, is stable, uh, it, it turns out that as the number of iterations increases, the distance between any given quantile of the distribution, let's say the median, at iteration n, and iteration n plus k will converge to zero. That's, again, another standard result from Monte Carlo sampling. From this, we can develop uh, a distance measure. Uh, we can just compare what's the distance between quantiles over potentially a grid of all quantiles, or w whatever we want to look at, and we could look at the percentage change between two sets of iterations. So between iteration 1,000 and iteration 1,500, has my distribution shifted? Or what's the, uh, what's the average shift in the points of my distribution? Uh, and your alpha there is just a, it will give you different distance metrics, essentially. So this is nice because it involves no discretization of the underlying outcome distribution, so it provides what you might call a useful cross-check on the good Turing-type measures. And so we can use this as a stopping rule. So stop drawing from my stochastic distribution, my stop undertaking stochastic distribution, uh, draws, sorry, if both of these measures fall below uh, certain thresholds. So that's the idea. So we're identifying the completeness of the search. Um, two applications. How long have I got? Just to, uh, I don't want to. Okay, well, I'll be quick. So let me apply these methods to two uh, uh, approaches. The first is, the, is, is, is simple. It's the human development index. And I think we're reasonably familiar with that. Uh, the, most, uh, the most recent form of the index, they moved from an arithmetic to, geo, geo, uh, to geometric means, uh, can be seen in generalized form at the bottom here, where the, the, the W, the well, omegas, the Ws, uh, are looking uh, at other weights. So what I'm doing here is I'm drawing stochastically random weights and seeing what happens. So just looking at three specific countries, uh, what, what happens as I increase the number of draws that I've taken? And as you can see, uh, the UGS is this uh, a good Turing. It's, one, it's the conservative version of the good Turing type measures. The D0, it should be D infinity, so it's actually the maximum percentage change. Apologize for that is also uh, shown. And as you can see, both measures decline relatively sharply. So, uh, for example, for Nepal, which has, the, uh, which has the highest values of all these, so that's why it's chosen, after 5,000 draws, uh, the estimate is that I've seen 8.6% of all possible outcomes. Sorry, I've, I've less, sorry, I've, I've seen, I haven't seen 8.6% of all possible outcomes. So, which I've seen more than 90% of all possible outcomes uh, for any parameter choice. And the distance measure is also very small that says that you know, the expected change in the next 500 uh, draws uh, is less than 0.06% of any quantile on the distribution. So these are quite comfortable. Uh, so that's saying I could assert the robustness with at least 90% across all uh, countries. So uh, this is... Uh, probably the main result, just for some selected countries. And this is then the point-wise robustness uh, measures for uh, sets of different bilateral comparisons. And if you just look at the lower diagonal, that's giving us the percentage of points uh, in the sample parameter space for which uh, the column country dominates the row country on the HDI index. And as you can see, there's some, there's some clear clearly robust comparisons. China, Nigeria. China dominates Nigeria 100% of the time. What about China, Botswana? So China, Botswana, approximately 80% of the time. So we can assert that chi the, 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 uh, the comparison between China and Botswana is not strictly robust. There are parameter choices by which Botswana dominates China, but 80% of the time, China dominates Botswana, and there's other ones there as well to see. So this is a simple version um, of the idea. Let's take it to a slightly more complex function, which is the Alkir uh, Foster 
poverty measures. And here is a summary of the poverty measure, which probably isn't very clear. But I'm going to focus on the headcount measure. And the headcount uh, measure is simply uh, a weighted set of, uh, a weighted count of deprivations. Uh, and if that exceeds a specified cutoff, uh, this is the HI here, kappa, the unit, typically a household, would be considered poor. So the, real, the, the parameter choices here are which weights do I give to which deprivations and what's the cutoff threshold. So all I do is I run, uh, again, stochastic simulation, different choices of weights and thresholds. Uh, and in this case, I apply to Mozambique with seven dimensions. And I'm looking at three household surveys over time, so on and so forth. But let's go to the results. What happens to my measures of missing mass? Again, uh, as expected, they decline. So let's look at the, for example, just the final, the final two columns there for 2008 to 2009. By, after 2,000 uh, draws from uh, the parameter space, I've seen around 80% of the outcomes. But by 10,000 draws, I've seen uh, almost 99% of all possible outcomes. Similarly, for the distance measures, there by 10,000 draws, I've fallen below 1%. So my expected change uh, of any quantile has fallen below 1%. So again, this is a comforting uh, that I've done sufficient number of uh, iterations that I've seen this parameter space completely. And what do we find? Well, these are two uh, kernel density estimates um, of the difference in, uh, this is just the raw headcount measure, uh, the uh, multidimensional headcount between uh, two periods. And as you can see, for the blue uh, density, which is the difference between 96 and 2002, uh, there's no point at which uh, that falls below zero. So for any choice of weights or cutoffs, it turns out that poverty declined between 96 and 2002. And I can assert that with a degree of confidence noted previously. However, for 2002 to 2008, as you can see, there's a share, a proportion of the uh, parameter, parameters that give us an alternative result. So poverty did not decline, although for the majority of cases it did. So again, this provides us with an indication of the degree of robustness of that poverty comparison. And we can extend that to regions uh, over time, uh, as I've done here. I don't think there's probably time to look at that in detail. But again, the values below the, uh, below, below the diagonal are giving the share of points in the parameter space um, for which the column group, which is a region seen at a particular time, has superior welfare to the row group. And what's interesting is that you see the southern uh, so SO2 would be the south seen in 2002. Welfare dominates both the north and the center 90% of the time, even in 2008. So that's in indicating what we know about Mozambique as very large uh, regional differences in welfare. So let me just uh, summarize. Stochastic search is a very powerful tool used uh, in large numbers of applications. The main limitation, uh, particularly in the issue of identifying robustness, is the coverage of the search is unknown. How many draws are enough? Uh, I propose two estimators to, to measure the completeness of the simulation. They aren't completely new, but they're neither widely known or have been used in this context before. And the, uh, we can use pointwise comparisons and assert pointwise comparisons uh, with an almost uh, certain amount of confidence. And I believe the applications are quite fruitful. Thank you very much.